attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Patchwork propaganda, forcibly arrested, and rock bottom wiener. Plus this day in history with the death of Bonzo and our song of the day by the reverberations on your morning monarchy for September 25th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another week of listener-supported media brought to you by you, my friends. Thank you so much. We are streaming live. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Quit that commercial radio job a couple years ago because I wanted to make independent radio for you. And that's what we do. Each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news. I think it's a great way that we can cover a lot of topics and a lot of a lot of grounds. And Monday's world news. The hashtag is geopolitics and all the stories we talk, we're going to talk about in this upcoming hour. Tweeted out about an hour before showtime. You can also find an invite to the chat in the tweets. Oh, somebody's saying Discord won't connect up right now. I'm in there and you can hopefully listen even to the show through Discord. So you can have the chat and the audio. Now, if you don't want to get in Discord, not on the chat, you can, of course, just click that link. It'll open up your iTunes, VLC, Windows Media Player, Winamp. Hell yeah. Hope you had a fantastic, productive, safe, awesome, beautiful weekend. Did our best here at home and, of course, celebrated my wonderful wife's birthday. So we had some good times, went out and about, did a little, of course, when the girls are going to go shoe shopping. Then I head to the record store, picked up a clutch of new records that we can probably talk about this week. As we bust out music on your pump up the volume, you get an hour of news in the morning as your morning monarchy, an hour of music each and every day as your pump up the volume. And again, it is all brought to you by you. Huge thanks to our patrons, supporters, Bitcoiners, and more. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. Huge thanks to you. That's what keeps us going. Anything big going on? It is a World News Monday geopolitics, so let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into all our geopolitical news. That again, we're not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. All of our news brought to you by you. Hashtag geopolitics. We spell it with a K, and that way we can sort of own that hashtag, if you will. Almost no North Koreans travel to the U.S., so why ban them? The Washington Compost asked the question. Pyongyang keeps up military threats against U.S. after Trump's ridicule. Yeah, and essentially all these stories we're going to cover on geopolitics. Football guy calls president guy divisive. And just a little bit ago, I actually already had the stories all teed up because I knew that pretty much as we were hitting the air, Anthony Weiner was going to get sentenced. And indeed he has. And we've got all of that coming up at the end of this episode because that gets us slowly into our cyberspace war news for Tech Tuesday. It's all a rich tapestry. We also got news about Merkel. Vows to win back right-wing voters as she is essentially the longest world leader holding power. Now, I know you need your fact check, and Alphabet Incorporated and the other corporate news agencies have all teamed up to let you know exactly what to think about certain divisive issues. So your fact checks today, Trump's mostly false claim that NFL ratings are way down. You can go that uh, PolitiFact. NFL fines Pittsburgh Steelers a million dollars each for skipping national anthem, question mark, from Snopes. God, speaking of Snopes, coming up this Friday, I've got an amazing story. That is true, because Snopes says so, and of course there's visual representation for it as well. Amazing bit of predictive programming in comic books going back to an issue of Heavy Metal from 1990. That's coming up on Friday's episode. Fergie did not release a new album to profit off Josh Duhamel's split, despite report. That's from Gossip Cop. What did we learn from Theresa May's Florence speech? BBC asked that question. And finally, the Washington Post. Trump's claim that 10 refugees overseas cost as much as one in the U.S. Now, the other bit of news that did break over the weekend, and I see it here on my music list and the entertainment list, that is the Screaming Eagle of Soul. Charles Bradley passed away over the weekend at the age of 68, and I haven't confirmed this yet, but I think possibly Cassie and I saw his final concert. We saw him two days in a row at Pickathon. We actually even caught one of the roses he threw off the stage. So that's our breaking lamestream news. Death of Charles Bradley, certainly not named lame, and we will be honoring him this week. And we were talking about tinnitus in the chat. <laughs> you ever hear things? I'm like, yeah, I mostly hear. That's usually why I like to have so much media going. All right, let's dive into all of this. And what better way to pretty much set the stage with, I think, blowing the lid off of these insane notions that whoever's in the White House is actually going to change something. 
it was a good show. It was a big, nice production. Had a lot of like emotional highs and somber lows. But now that the rubber meets the road, as they say, Trump falls in line with interventionism. In discussing President Trump, there's always the soft prejudice of low expectations. Hey, you can use a teleprompter. There's no getting around that his maiden address to the United Nations General Assembly might rank as one of the more embarrassing moments in American relations with the globalist community. Trump offered, and we spoke about this briefly on your latest episode of New World Next Week, crude patchwork propaganda and bluster. Partly delivered as a campaign speech praising his own leadership, which of course continues to go on, and that's the thing to think about. And I believe the watchword of this episode will be jingoism. Boasting about the relatively strong U.S. economy that he mostly inherited from the other puppet, and partly reflecting his continued subservience to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Maybe most importantly, Trump's speech may have extinguished any flickering hope that his presidency might achieve some valuable course corrections in how the United States deals with the world, i.e. blowing things up, disastrous war and interventionist policies. Before he gave the UNGA speech, there was at least some thinking that his visceral disdain for the neocons who mostly opposed his nomination and election, but now have completely infested his administration. I'm sure it's just all, all an accident. All the same things, Iran, Iraq, Syria. All keeps going on. You th would think maybe he would actually get up and speak against that, since that was campaign Trump. But instead, he got up and essentially what Robert Perry calls went into neocon full Monty repeated the Israeli neocon tripe about Iran destabilizing the Middle East when Shiite ruled Iran actually helped stabilize Iraq and Syria against the Sunni terrorists and other militants, of course, supported by the Saudis and the Israelis. Trump again denounced the Iranian nuclear agreement, whose main flaw in the eyes of the Israelis and the neocons is that it disrupted their plans to, as insane in the McCain said, bomb, 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 bomb Iran. Trump called for regime change in Iran, a long-beloved dream of, again, the Israelis and the neocons. He repeated their propaganda about Hezbollah as a terrorist organization when their crime was driving Israel out of southern Lebanon in 2000. He praised his rush to judgment decision to bomb Syria last April. Is that the, was that the mother of all bombs or was we dropping that in Afghanistan? I think that was maybe a different war operation. Bombing Syria because of sketchy chemical weapons information. And finally, he spoke with a crass hypocrisy that the neocons and many Israeli leaders have perfected, particularly his demand that all nations respect the rights of every other sovereign nation, when he made clear that he, like his White House predecessors, ready to violate the sovereignty of other nations that get in the way of so-called Washington. So it just goes on and on and on. Trump falls in line with interventionism. That's our first piece that we grabbed from Robert Perry, and that's on Consortium News. And again, everything we say and play will always be included in all the show notes, so you can continue the research. And as I like to say, you use that search function on the side of the page. We've been online for 12 years and now almost two weeks, and there are, I think, probably 12,000 articles, interviews, episodes, and so much more at MediaMonarchy.com. So I think this episode will just continue to show that the more things change, the more they will stay exactly the same. And it's two fake parties propping up this beast system. Call it what you want. Congress critters passed a roughly $700 billion National Defense Authorization Act one week ago, but failed to include an amendment that would have eliminated the automatic spending cuts under the controversial sequester mechanism. The NDAA, you know, the National Defense Authorization Act, the thing that sort of sprung up during the Bush years, that then all through President Peace Prize's years, he continually signed it up, gave more money to the military, kept Guantanamo open. The NDAA, which sets forth the Pentagon's budget and major programs for the next fiscal year, at least as far as the John Sixpack and Sally Soccer Mom are concerned, watching the news. This doesn't concern any of the other black ops and slush funds. The NDAA, which sets forth the Pentagon's budget and major programs for the next fiscal year, does authorize an additional $8.5 billion for the Missile Defense Agency to strengthen Homeland regional and space missile defense. That authorization is $630 million above the Trump administration's request. They gave them even more money than they asked for. 
Final vote was 89 to 8. Required a simple majority to pass the Senate. The 2018 National Defense Bill also authorizes just over $141 billion dollars for military personnel costs, including costs of pay, bonuses, benefits, transitioning to a different gender, moving expenses. It also provides a 2.1% in increase in pay for troops. Hooah! The legislation also includes money to increase troop numbers above the White House's request, adding thousands of new members to the Army and Marine Corps, as well as boosting reserve totals. Also, in the final version for the defense bill is a provision that bars the Defense Department from using security software products from Russian-based Kaspersky Labs. In all, more than 300 amendments were proposed for the Senate's NDAA, and that's where everybody tacks on all their pork, all their good stuff for their hometowns, all their missile bases that are back in their backyard. The House already passed its own version of the 2018 Defense Authorization Bill, or H.R. 2810, in July. So last Monday's passage means the House Senate Conference Committee will need to resolve differences before sending the legislation, of course, to President Donald Trump. Final Senate version of the bill is 1,215 pages, and I'm sure they've read every single bit of it, right? also includes a base budget of $640 billion and another $60 billion for the so-called Overseas Contingency Operations. That's all capitalized. I know it's important. OCO. That's war funding, which includes money for all the wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and I like how CNBC says, and other locations. The U.S. Senate passed its version of a $700 billion defense policy bill on Monday, backing President Donald Trump's call for a bigger, stronger military, but setting the stage for a battle over government spending levels later this year. The Republican-controlled chamber voted 89-8 to for the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2018, or NDA. DAA, which authorizes the level of defense spending and sets policies controlling how the money is spent. The Senate bill provides about $640 billion for the Pentagon's main operations, such as buying weapons and paying the troops, and some $60 billion to fund the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. The House of Representatives passed its version of the NDAA at a similar spending level in July. A standing army is like a standing member. It's an excellent assurance of domestic tranquility, but a dangerous temptation to foreign adventure. I don't know who said that quote, but thanks for placing that in the chat, Norman. You are listening to Your Morning Monarchy. It is Monday, September 25th, 2017, and we're streaming live from MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, and we are looking at world news. Hey, you haven't heard too much about the North American Union lately, have you? Oh, that's because it's stealth. How about all those other things that candidate... Trump talked about that he was going to undo. One of them, I believe, had been referred to as one of the other wrestling contestants as the gold standard of trade deals. Well, talks to update the North American Free Trade Agreement intensified on Saturday, although U.S. negotiators looked set to once again withhold proposals for one of the Trump administration's most challenging issues. Teams from the United States, Mexico, and Canada kicked off the third of seven planned rounds of discussions in Ottawa amid warnings from trade experts that time was quickly running out to seal a deal by the end of the year as planned. One key issue is the U.S. desire to strengthen rules of origin for autos, which dictate how much of a vehicle's components must originate from within North America to qualify for tax-free status. And that's the game that they play on a lot of products. Oh, it's made in America which means they screwed together the two parts that were all made in different foreign countries under slave sweatshop labor. The American side did not mention a single specific goal in the first two rounds, and Canada's chief NAFTA negotiator on Saturday said he did not think the United States would provide more details during the Ottawa round. We're not expecting that, no. Steve Rahal told reporters predicting the pace of the talks would nonetheless quicken. That's a very beautiful written article, Reuters. According to a schedule of the talks obtained by Reuters, rules of origin will be discussed tomorrow and Wednesday. America's next top president wants more U.S. content in autos, citing trade deficits of $64 billion with Mexico and $11 billion with Canada. Trump, who says NAFTA is weighted against his country, has threatened to walk away from the agreement in an exciting wrestling move. Flavio Volpe, president of the Canadian Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, said late on Friday, as we always seem to talk about what happens late on Friday, we got to dig it up Monday morning, 
He felt it was too early for detailed rule of origin proposals, given that U.S. officials were still talking to the domestic industry. It's fine for us if they take a little longer, so we all understand what our interests are, and we make the right deal. We don't need an early deal. U.S. Chief Negotiator John Mell said ahead of the talks that his team would introduce the difficult provisions in Ottawa talks that are due to last for five days. Another tricky, tricky, tricky issue is how to rock a rhyme, rock a rhyme on time, but it's also labor. Given complaints from U.S. and Canadian unions that Mexico's low wages give it a manufacturing advantage. The states are also expected to present proposals on intellectual property and investment. See, this is the part where you get down to the, list, the last few sentences. Like, oh, and by the way, we're going to manipulate copyright and all kinds of other intellectual property ridiculous ideas. Sources with knowledge of the discussion said other areas of the disagreement include dispute settlement mechanisms. Canadian and Mexican officials, as well as U.S. businesses, have already rejected a proposal by Washington to include a five-year sunset provision in the updated agreement, saying it added uncertainty to investment planning. So if there's any correlation between some of the few rules and things that we've seen passed, the one thing they don't want is to add in rules that say, and eventually this will expire. Whoa, whoa, whoa! what we constantly mention the house of lies get them on the tit you can't have it expire you gotta have it go on forever we don't know when the state of emergency will end hey sidebar i feel like i saw every time eight years when obama continued the 9-11 state of emergency this was just such a great beautiful example of all of his lies and all the things that he went against as soon as he got into office oh you'll continue on the 9-11 lie have we seen, have they released, has Trump reauthorized the 9-11 state of emergency? Somebody can tweet me that or post that in the chat. I'd appreciate you. I'm James Evan Pilato, streaming live from MediaMonarchy.com. Two of my favorite things are really, really coming together in just a, just a fantastic way. Politics and sports. Treasury Secretary Monster, who, and again... I don't recall if the Obama administration streamed as many of their press conferences back in the day. And it may have just been perhaps the audience wasn't there, the drive wasn't there, the interest wasn't there. But now we can see the press conferences that they do. They stream live right on YouTube, right on YouTube.com slash White House. I find it really interesting how much coverage Mnuchin gets every day. He's like, hey, here I am. Goldman Sachs Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin thinks pro football players lose their right to free speech once they don the pads and take the field. Mnuchin said on Disney's This Week yesterday that they have the right to the First Amendment off the field. He's defending Trump's attacks on football players kneeling during the national anthem. Mnuchin says standing during the anthem shows respect for the military, because that's first and foremost, and first responders. He says they can do free speech on their own time. Mnuchin argues the president was trying to unify the country because the national anthem is about unification. Bombs bursting in air. Trump said on Friday that NFL owners should fire players who kneel during the anthem. A few players have refused to stand to protest police brutality and other random issues. Now you guys, like Mance Raider on the tweets this morning, <laughs> noted... You can, Please stop disrespecting America, and especially, you guys got to stop burning those flags. We're going to need those flags to wrap in all the coffins that are going to continue to come home from the wars. My buddy Greeny had a bumper sticker I loved. Post 9-11. It had a little yellow ribbon on it, and it had some American flag thing, and it said, I support mindless jingoistic cliches. Now, I got to say... You guys, I was not standing for the pledge way back, way before it was cool. <laughs> Nothing will make you popular in high school like not standing for the pledge in the class that's taught by the coach. And those are those moments, again, that you realize as a kid, like, wait, I don't have to do this. They can't force me to do this. That was a lot of fun in school, realizing the things you could actually say no to. And watch their faces go, yeah, buh, 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 what, what? You're not going to stand stand for the pledge? Nope. And again, this was, you know, the heady days of Gulf War One. 
So let's get a little bit of reminders here, as long as we're all waving the flag and having a little bit of jingoism and watching our sports ball, and it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> you can't, you can't make this shit up. Trump has doubled down on his rhetoric. Yeah, did it even one of his, does one, did one of his tweets have swears in it? They gotta fire that son of a bitch. I saw it quoted, but I didn't see the actual thing. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell says that the NFL players are at our best when we help create a sense of unity in our country and our culture. Oh, he said it in his speech. He didn't tweet it. Okay, thank you for that. All of this comes together in just the most obvious, painful, jock kind of way. But let's get a little bit of levity, shall we? In 2009... Barack Obama's Defense Department began paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to NFL teams in a marketing strategy designed to show support for the troops and increase recruitments because they need meat for the grinder. The NFL then required all players and personnel to be on the sidelines during the National Anthem in exchange for taxpayer dollars. Prior, the National Anthem was played in the stadium, but players had the option of staying in the locker room before heading out to the field. During the Obama administration, they forced them to come out and stand for it. Because they were stealing your thefts to do it. Furthermore, teams that showed veteran salutes during games were paid upwards of $5.1 million. The NFL, of course, has shown different degrees of propaganda patriotism at different times, such as after 9-11... But as Flake from Arizona noted in 2015, those of us go to sporting events and see them honoring the heroes, you get a good feeling in your heart. Then to find out they're doing it because they're compensated for it, it leaves you underwhelmed. That's a great Sloan song. It seems a little unseemly. It is a little unseemly. Because I think if you told a lot of those people that they were stealing your taxes to propagandize you back on the TV, I don't know, maybe on the one hand they'd get really angry, but then on the other hand they probably wouldn't care and they'd shuffle back to the fridge to get another Bud Light. President Trump sparked national controversy on Friday night when he said NFL owners should, quote, get that son of a bitch off the field, end quote, if a player is not standing for the flag as a way of showing protest against police brutality. And now what? There's some extra thing about <laughs> NASCAR. Said, oh, but, but all our guys all stood up for the pledge. So it's this now insane, propagandistic, jingoistic race. And we've seen it before. We've seen it in this country and we've seen it in other countries. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Monday, September 25th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Bad news, y'all. Free Speech Week has been canceled. All of the events that were set to begin Sunday at right-wing media personality Milo Yiannopoulos' free speech week are canceled. According to UC Berkeley's administration, representatives from the Berkeley Patriot Student Organization informed the administration of the last-minute decision Saturday morning. And in a letter to interim Vice Chancellor Stephen Sutton announcing the cancellation, the Berkeley Patriots attorney, Marguerite Melo, wrote, The student group has been subjected to extraordinary pressure and resistance, if not outright hostility, by the UC Berkeley administration. The original cancellation statement issued by Berkeley's administration said the external parties made claims that the university wanted to place the speakers in harm's way. But the university was preparing for considerable campus life disruption and was in the process of spending a sum in excess of $1 million to beef up security and make the event safe. We want to state unequivocally that campus leadership has complete faith in the UCPD as well as the extraordinary number of allied law enforcement agencies who agreed to contribute. On Friday, conservative commentator Ann Coulter withdrew from speaking at the four-day event and cited that she never had a contract. Coulter said she had no desire to give the university a second chance. I'm not sure if the rest of the Berkeley campus deserves to hear from the likes of my educational edifice and entertaining speeches, Coulter said in a phone call with KTVU. Following her announcement, Chanel Corby, a spokeswoman for Yiannopoulos, reported that the event would still take place despite media reports that it had been canceled. Yiannopoulos addressed the public through... Fedbook live at 11.45 Saturday morning. He apologized to those who traveled from out of town and said UC Berkeley is to blame for the mishap. He claims he will work to reimburse any lost traveling funds. Your face has canceled. As we were going to note earlier, we were talking about the flags and sports ball and showing your respect. 
What St. Higgs said was that the flag is just a symbol, and one of the main things that symbol represents is the freedom to burn the fucking flag. You know Jim Norton, comedian, radio host? He was actually in Portland this last week. He blew through Portland and didn't do a little comedy club. He played at one of the, one of the bigger venues, played at the Aladdin. And I saw an interview with him from one of the good local media outlets, Portland Tribune. They had an interview with Jim, of course, before the show, trying to promote the show. In that interview, at one point, they talk about, of course, the criticism he may get. He says, well, so who's, where's the criticism coming from? Jim says, it's from the left. It's all, and they put it in italics, it's all from the left. Because that's the way the pendulum has swung this time. But the problem we have is getting people to look up and see that that pendulum is still attached to the corrupt clock. It might be right twice a day. And perhaps in some ways that pendulum swinging is a little more like the... Could it be the Sword of Damocles? Could it be the Edgar Allan Poe thing? We'll figure that out. Let's continue to look at geopolitics and what happens in the states when you don't go along with things. Even if you do go along with things. You might get scooped up. An undercover St. Louis police officer and an Air Force lieutenant who lives in the neighborhood were among several people who say they were forcibly arrested last weekend in the city of St. Louis, even though they were not participating in protests over the acquittal of a white former officer in the killing of a black suspect. About 120 people were arrested. And this is the stories of all the people kind of going into the malls, which I find kind of ironic and hilarious. About 120 people were arrested, most for failing to disperse, about two hours after vandals broke windows and threw items at police last Sunday. The officers used a tactic called kettling that boxes in demonstrators and others in the area. It's basically a big net, you know, like Mr. Burns' Omni net. Just scoops everything up. Oh, I never had a chance to get out of it. Protests continued on Saturday when several people were arrested at the upscale Gallery Mall in suburban St. Louis, where more than 200 demonstrators marched and chanted among shoppers. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported officers briefly cleared the mall in Richmond Heights, Missouri, after some members of the group became unruly. St. Louis County Police said in a series of tweets that about 150 people dispersed before 22 people were arrested. Charges were expected to include trespassing, rioting, assault on law enforcement officer, and disorderly conduct. One officer was taken to the hospital for a back injury, and two protesters suffered minor injuries from the cop whose back was hurting. I'm kidding. By Saturday night, protesters had moved to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Clayton, another suburb on the Missouri side. They then took their calls outside the doors of the Target store in Brentwood, Missouri, but eventually left. Some demonstrators ended up outside the St. Louis County Justice Center in Clayton, hoping that those in custody would be released. The city's acting police chief and... Oh. The city's acting police chief and governor, Eric Greetens, Greetens, had praised the officers for controlling the demonstrations, but there have been growing criticisms that blah, blah, blah. Now, that's interesting. Is it because of emergency orders that they've implemented that the city's acting police chief is also the governor? That's interesting. Police said they were arrested only if they didn't follow orders to disperse, but some people said they had nowhere to go because police had boxed them in. The undercover officer was mistaken for a suspect who was carrying chemicals that could be sprayed on officers. I, I wonder why he was looked at like that. Is it possible he was there to perform false flag activities, as we've seen many, many times? Cops and military do. Hey, look at that protester. Look at his military boots, how shiny and new they are. When the man refused to show his hands, he was knocked down and hit several times with his hands tied behind his back and mouth bloodied. On Friday, Mayor Lida Krusen asked the director of public safety to investigate how the officer was arrested. During the same protest, Air Force Lieutenant Alex Nelson, age 27, who lives in the neighborhood with his wife, said they were trapped in the kettling. The tactic police used to box in demonstrators. He said he was kicked in the face, blinded by pepper spray, and dragged away. I hear the police say it was their street, but it's literally my street. I have coffee on that street. I own property on that street. We're not active protesters. We were looking into the neighborhood to observe events that were unfolding. He said the police actions were incredibly unnecessary because he followed every demand and officers never gave an order to disperse. He said when he told an officer he was with the military, the police officer replied, quote, shut up, stop, I don't care. 
A documentary filmmaker from Kansas City who was visiting with his wife said he was knocked unconscious during the sweep. Drew Burbage, 32, said he never heard orders to disperse until officers started to advance, banging their batons and chanting, move back. I turned my camera off and asked if there was anywhere I could go, but I was denied the right to leave. I didn't want to be a part of this. He said after he was on the ground, officers grabbed him by both arms and dragged him away. He said he was sprayed with a, with a chemical and eventually knocked unconscious for 10 to 30 seconds. And when he came to, an officer pepper sprayed him again. More than 160 people have been arrested since demonstrations began September 15th after a judge found Jason Stockley not guilty of first-degree murder in the 2011 death of 24-year-old drug suspect Anthony Lamar Smith after a vehicle chase. Most of those arrests on the night of the ruling all happened over that weekend, that night of the ruling on Sunday. Now, false flag possibilities aside, I think in some ways it's a positive thing when other cops and other military members are being harassed and attacked by other members of the state, that might actually do some bit of good. That might cause some kind of change. That might cause some of those people to go, oh, I can't work for this system. I can't be a cop. I can't be a soldier. I'm out. Now, we've seen kettling before, and that's why we always say past is prologue, and that's we, I, why we always talk about this day in history at the end of every episode. Nearly 10 years after the Madison Square Garden hosted the 20... What was it? Uh, 2004 Republican National Convention. Yeah, remember they put that thing in New York City. The city has agreed to pay $18 million to settle dozens of lawsuits brought by protesters and bystanders who claimed they were wrongly arrested during the event. Lawyers for the plaintiffs who rallied last Wednesday outside City Hall called the agreement the largest civil rights settlement in United States history arising from mass arrests of protesters. The city will pay $6.4 million to 430 individual plaintiffs, $6.6 million to settle a class action lawsuit filed by 1,200 additional people, and $5 million in legal fees. All essentially comes up to about $18 million of thefts. So get, get a load of this. The cops abuse you and arrest a bunch of people. Of course, completely illegal. A decade goes by, 13 years, and they go, okay, yeah, it was illegal. Here's a bunch of money. Where'd you get all that money? Hey, we stole it from you. They're using your stolen thefts to pay you back off for mistreating you. That's how this works. This historic settlement sends a clear message, said the New York Civil Liberties Union. We will not allow the police to trample on the First Amendment rights of protesters. Mayor de Blasio said he was glad the case is settled. We're going to take a very different view going forward about how we respect people's rights to express themselves. And that's just in New York. What about all the cages they locked people up in Chicago where there were similar protests during big election times? So there's very little new under the sun. Again, it just has some different names. Some different shapes, maybe some different music and style, but actually, uh, the names aren't really that different. In late December 1974, the New York Times published an article reporting a massive set of CIA operations conducted domestically and targeting American citizens. A memo marked confidential in the Kissinger archives shows that Henry Kissinger and White House Chief of Staff Donald Rumsfeld were planning a public response to the article's allegations almost immediately. Their goals were simple to reassure the public that the activities in the article weren't happening, but that people would be held accountable if they were. This sentiment is ironic considering their later concern that people not be worried about being prosecuted in a decade after participating in illegal CIA activities. Regardless, they sought to assure people that the president had firm control over the CIA's activities in order to maintain public confidence in the intelligence community. To this end, Kissinger suggested to Rumsfeld that the White House not issue a statement at all. In Kissinger's view, a formal statement would have lent credence to the article's accusations and create the impression that the Ford administration faced a scandal of major proportions. Kissinger wanted to make it clear that any abuses antedated the current administration and wouldn't be continuing under President Ford. The problems which were coming to light were categorically the fault of someone no longer in power and thus the current administration should be blameless. This strategy would be brought up again in the ensuing fallout. The ultimate goal, however, wasn't simply to exonerate and insulate the current administration. 
but to, quote, keep the matter within the administration and head off, if possible, a full-blown congressional investigation. The proposed Q&A sent by Kissinger sought to create the impression that the president was acting to quickly investigate the manner and that his only prior knowledge of the allegations came from the New York Times' advance notice that the article was going to come out. Other significant pieces of the proposed Q&A, designed for engagement with the press, remains redacted, allegedly to protect sources and methods. The proposed Q&A also addressed the possibility of the president recalling director Richard Helms from his ambassadorial position to get his version of the events. At the time, no such plan existed. When Helms was brought into the discussion, however, things quickly became contentious. Memo shows Kissinger and Rumsfeld in damage control mode following revelation of CIA domestic activities. Speaking of domestic activities, and this is really the good stuff that puts the media into the monarchy. I had not actually seen or watched the video yet. I had only really listened to it while I was prepping the clip. Holy moly. Director Rob Reiner is joining a new group called the Committee to Investigate Russia to highlight what is known about the Russian threat to interfere with American selections and other institutions. The committee went live with a website, investigaterussia.org, as well as launching a new video featuring Morgan Freeman. We have been attacked. We are at war. Imagine this movie script. A former KGB spy Angry at the collapse of his motherland, plots a course for revenge. Taking advantage of the chaos, he works his way up through the ranks of a post-Soviet Russia and becomes president. He establishes an authoritarian regime, then he sets his sights on his sworn enemy, the United States. And like the true KGB spy he is, he secretly uses cyber warfare to attack democracies around the world. Using social media to spread propaganda and false information, he convinces people in democratic societies to distrust their media, their political processes, even their neighbors. And he wins. Vladimir Putin is that spy, and this is no movie script. We need our president to speak directly to us and tell us the truth. We need him to sit behind the desk in the Oval Office and say, my fellow Americans, during this past election, we came under attack by the Russian government. I've called on Congress and our intelligence community to use every resource available to conduct a thorough investigation to determine exactly how this happened. The free world is counting on us for leadership. For 241 years, our democracy has been a shining example to the world of what we can all aspire to. And we owe it to the brave people who have fought and died to protect this great nation and save democracy. And we owe it to our future generations to continue the fight. Join the committee to investigate Russia. Join Holy the Holy living shit. They got the guy that does the voiceover for God in the movies to spew propaganda at us. You also might recognize that voice as the narrator of the Hillary propaganda piece at the Democratic National Con Convention last year. Now, while you're looking for the face palm emoji, you might just have to settle for SMH. Let's look at some other celebrities who may or may not know exactly what they're doing. Our new friend Johnny Vedmore, we've kind of met him on the tweets, and we super appreciate his support of Media Monarchy. He has an article up on the swamp.media called The Potomac Institute, The CIA, and 9-11. It's actually a really good article because it gets into all of the things that were put into play pre-9-11. Essentially, all the pieces, all the parts, all the plot lines, all the enemies, all the stunning twists and turns had all been placed out into the public domain through all the think tanks, the NGOs, the CFRs, the CIAs, the PNACs, all of it. There was also another group called the Potomac Institute, and they pushed for war. One of the members of the Potomac Institute is a guy named Jeff Baxter. He's actually on the Board of Regents and Senior Fellow at the Potomac Institute. You might also know him as Jeff Skunk Baxter, former member of Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers. 
Mr. Jeff Baxter currently serves as chairman of the Civilian Advisory Board for Ballistic Missile Defense. He's also acted in an advisory capacity for Congressman Kurt Weldon and Dana Rohrbacher and has participated in numerous war games for the Pentagon. Mr. Baxter also serves on the Laser Advisory Board at the well-renowned, oh, so well-renowned, all their leaks and spills at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, of course, down in New Mexico, good God, and has lectured at the University of Manitoba School of Political Science on the subject of regional conflict and missile defense. You would think that the Potomac Institute would not be the likely scene for the ex-guitarist of the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan, but Jeff Skunk Baxter, now, I wonder if skunk means skunk works, <clears throat> He was a music production enthusiast and became enthralled in the hardware and software that originated in the military. Data compression algorithms and large capacity storage devices are also used in missile defense systems. With the help of a neighbor who worked on the Sidewinder Missile Program and Aviation Week magazine... Jeff Baxter taught himself missile defense technology. He now consults for the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community and for defense-oriented manufacturers including SAIC, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics... Jeff Skunk Baxter has been quoted as saying, quote, We thought turntables were for playing records until rappers began to use them as instruments, and we thought airplanes were for carrying passengers until terrorists realized they could be used as missiles. Some rumors state that Jeff Baxter was recruited as a CIA agent by his neighbor who helped develop his interest in ballistic missiles. And of course, Jeff Skunk Baxter also appears as a guest on CNN and Fox News to advocate for missile defense. Really interesting piece from Johnny Vedmore, the Potomac Institute, the CIA, and 9-11. Fantastic work there. Let's continue to look around the world at geopolitics. Holy moly, we're going to have to start wrapping up this episode. Pentagon plans massive global war games to prepare for Russia and other threats. Written by Jason Ditz, originally on Antiwar.com, Activist Post has it, continuing to envision the new Cold War with Russia as both a ticket for ongoing increases in military spending and a convenient way to coax regional allies into complicated alliances, the Pentagon is increasingly interested in building its war games across broad global conflicts, and in particular, a war with Russia. Brigadier General John Healy, who coordinates exercises in Europe, says the U.S. wants to prepare for more complex wars with broader goals. The long run in the U.S. is working towards a single, globally integrated war game so that all the exercises are on the same page and part of the same global war game. Meanwhile, U.S. Defense Secretary Mad Dog Mattis has hinted at using a kinetic weapon while discussing tensions with North Korea when he made a Freudian slip. Mattis was asked whether there was any military option the U.S. can take with North Korea that would not put Seoul at grave risk. He said, yes, there are, but I will not go into details. Later during the press conference, another reporter questioned Mad Dog Madison. Oh, caught him off guard. Just to clarify, you said that there were possible military options that would not create a grave risk to Seoul. Are we talking kinetic options as well? Yeah, I don't want to go into that. Don't! Defense Secretary Jim Mattis hinted that the United States still had military options left for dealing with North Korea. He did not elaborate, though, when asked for details Monday. According to most experts, a military strike on North Korea would invite a devastating response from Pyongyang. The city of Seoul, South Korea, is home to 25 million people. It lies well within artillery range of the North. According to Mattis, however, the Pentagon has a few tricks up its sleeve that wouldn't involve the decimation of Seoul. He was asked whether there was any military option the U.S. can take with North Korea that would not put Seoul in grave risk. Mattis responded, yes, there are, but I will not go into details. Deeper shade of soul, the 100,000-ton U.S. Navy supercarrier Ronald Reagan has conducted drills with Japanese warships south of the Korean peninsula. Pyongyang, meanwhile, has threatened a further hydrogen bomb test over the Pacific. Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force said in a statement on dumping day that the Nimitz-class nuclear-powered supercarrier Ronald Reagan, based in Yokosuka, and its escort ships have been holding drills with the Japanese Navy in water south and west of Japan's main islands, of course, since 9-11. Meanwhile, the day after America's next top president's barnstorming speech to the U.N. General Assembly decrying a scourge of rogue states and terrorism, it was reported that his administration is set to greatly loosen American arms exports. The trade in question is in the private sector of so-called non-military weapons. This all comes out of a investigative report from Balkan Insight, the Pentagon's $2.2 billion Soviet arms pipeline, 
flooding Syria with weapons. Now, now, does this have to do with any of those things that we talked about on New World Next Week, where the Bulgarian journalist exposed the CIA running of weapons throughout Syria and all their little shell games and front companies? They're just going to change the names, change some of the paperwork. Meanwhile, Germany's Angela Merkel began the tough task of trying to build a government this morning after securing a fourth term as chancellor, urging the center-left Social Democrats not to shut the door on a rerun of their grand coalition. Damaged by her decision two years ago to allow more than one million migrants into Germany, Merkel's conservative bloc secured 33% of the votes, losing 8.5 points, its lowest level since 1949. Her coalition partners, the center-left Social Democrats, also slumped and said they would go into opposition mode. Speaking of opposition mode, forced takeover of Catalan government institutions by Spanish police ahead of the October 1st vote. And we have not actually looked at a lot of what's going on around Latin America on this episode of Your Morning Monarchy. I haven't looked at Philippines or Venezuela at all. But again, as I always say, each and every day has its own hashtag, and we only pick 10, 15 stories to talk about. There are all the other stories that I think will give you a further understanding of that area, whether it is geopolitics or food world order or cyberspace war. The federal government last Friday told election officials in 21 states that hackers targeted their systems before last year's presidential elections. The notification came roughly a year after the Department of Homeland Security officials first said states were targeted by hacking efforts possibly connected to Russia. The states that told the Associated Press they had been targeted included some key political battlegrounds such as Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Wisconsin. The Associated Press contacted every state election office to determine which ones had been informed that their election systems had been targeted. The others confirming were Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Iowa, Maryland, Minnesota, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, and Washington. Being targeted does not mean that sensitive voter data was manipulated or results were changed. You sure? Now, we reached the rock bottom of this episode, and I put Wiener at the bottom because I knew that when we hit the air this morning that he was going to get sentenced. Now, what happened over the weekend, however, before Anthony Wiener's sentencing this morning was that prosecutors unveiled the full details of Anthony Wiener's pedophilia. The government respectfully submits this memorandum in connection with the sentencing of Anthony Wiener, scheduled for September 25th, 2017, following his guilty plea to transferring obscene material to a minor. Although the defendant's self-destructive path from the United States congressman to felon is indisputably sad, his crime is serious and his demonstrated need for deterrence is real. The non-custodial sentence that Wiener proposes is simply inadequate. His crime deserves time in prison, and indeed, he's gotten 21 months. Former U.S. Congressman Anthony Wiener was sentenced to 21 months in prison on Monday for sending sexually explicit messages to a 15-year-old girl setting off a scandal that played a role in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. 53-year-old Wiener started to cry as soon as the sentence was announced by U.S. District Judge Denise Cote in Manhattan. He pleaded guilty in May to transferring obscene messages to a minor and agreed he would not appeal any sentence of 27 months or less. Wiener's lawyers had asked that he be sentenced to probation rather than prison, saying he acted out of the, quote, depths of an uncontrolled sickness, end quote, and was now being treated. And to add insult to injured Wiener, he was also fined $10,000. After a sentence is served, he must undergo internet monitoring and must have no contact with his victim. He must also enroll in a sex offender treatment program. Wienergate, intimately connected to America's Next Top President in 2016. And the phony game just continues to go on and on and on. And those are your geopolitics stories for September 25th. I got brand new music from a little Portland band called The Reverberations coming up in just a few minutes. But let's take a look at this day in history, my friends. September 25th, 1789, the United States Congress passes 12 amendments to the United States Constitution. The Congressional Apportionment Amendment, which was never ratified. The Congressional Compensation Amendment. And the 10 that are known as the Bill of Rights. Thanks, piece of paper, for giving me rights. What do you guys call it? The magic napkin? Save the magic napkin. 
September 25th, 1804, the Teton Sioux, a subdivision of the Lakota, demand one of the boats from the Lewis and Clark expedition as a toll for allowing the expedition to move further upriver. It's, you know, early tolls. 1890, the United States Congress establishes the Sequoia National Park on this day. In 1912, Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism was founded on this day in New York City. On September 25th, 1953, Liberace made his debut at Carnegie Hall with a sold-out show. Interesting enough, did you ever see the uh, Steven Soderbergh HBO movie? September 25th, 1956, TAT-1, the first submarine transatlantic telephone cable system was inaugurated on this day. 1957, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas is integrated by the use of United States Army troops. September 25th, 1959, Solomon Bandaranki, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, is mortally wounded by a Buddhist monk and dies the next day. That same day, Eisenhower and Khrushchev were meeting for talks in 1959. September 25th, 1975, Jackie Wilson collapsed on stage while performing Lonely Teardrops at the Latino Casino in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. He had suffered a heart attack that caused brain damage. He was only 41 years old. He died in 84 after spending the rest of his life in hospitals. September 25th, 1977, about 4,200 people take, play, take, take part in the first running of the Chicago Marathon. God, I saw these signs in town all over the weekend had been building up. There was the, what do they call it? It was like the MLK spirit run. I forget. It's just these posters. Like, I have a dream that I won't be exploited to sell your races and all your dumb stuff. September 25th, 1978, PSA Flight 182, a Boeing 727, collides in midair with a Cessna 172 and crashes in San Diego, killing 144 people, even kids on the ground in houses. September 25th, 1979, Gary Newman released the album Pleasure Principle in the U.S. As we've reported for you recently, he's got a big new scary global warming album because Trump... September 25th, 1980, John Bonzo Bonham of Led Zeppelin died of asphyxiation on his own vomit due to consumption of alcohol. The group decided to disband when they determined that their drummer could not be replaced. Of an autopsy that was performed today, John Bonham found dead in bed yesterday in London at the home of the group's guitarist, Jimmy Page. British newspapers said today that Bonham had a reputation for excessive drinking, but a coroner says that after this autopsy that he died without a trace of alcohol or drugs in his body. So as we say, cause of death still a mystery. Further tests though will be made next week. I have never heard that they never found a drop of alcohol in his system through the autopsy. The legendary John Bonham died on this day in 1980. Continuing to look at this day in history, September 25th, 1983, 38 IRA prisoners armed with six handguns hijack a prison meals lorry and smash their way out of the Mays prison. Mays, M-A-Z-E, capital letters. Not sure if that's out the back of the Overlook Hotel in The Shining or... September 25th, 1992, NASA launches the Mars Observer, a... $511 million probe to Mars in the first U.S. mission to the planet in 17 years. 11 months later, it broke. Published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. I got three stories for you. September 25th. <laughs> President Bush is quietly providing back-channel advice to Hillary Rodham Clinton, urging her to modulate her rhetoric so she can effectively prosecute the war in Iraq if elected president. Bush advises Hillary. We told you that a decade ago. In case, you know, you were still believing in this phony presidential bullshit. Speaking of phony presidential bullshit, another day, another girl stripping for her favorite presidential candidate. It was Ron Paul girl. I don't know if you remember the 2008 presidential selection circus. We had Obama girl, Giuliani girls, Hot for Hill, and then Ron Paul girl. And finally, see, we, I've said we've been talking about fake news for 12 plus years. We just didn't really have the term yet until after America's Next Top President. But looks like we did have the term for it, and it looks like I used it a decade ago today on MediaMonarchy.com. FCC finds Comcast for airing fake news. 
That's the quote from MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago. Cable giant Comcast violated the law by broadcasting video news releases. Those are VNRs. You know, it's kind of related to Conan O'Brien's pushing the envelope. But Comcast did it without identifying them as sponsored programming, the FCC announced. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. I didn't, it's funny, I of course even prepped all this stuff out and even laid and copied and pasted that out, but I guess I didn't fully appreciate that we had used fake news a decade ago today. I don't know what Nader girl would be. Celebrating birthdays today, September 25th, William Faulkner. French director and screenwriter Robert Bresson. It's also Mark Rothko's birthday. He's got some Portland connections. It is Shostakovich's birthday. He was born on this day in 1906. And I believe our oldest living birthday person was born on this day in 1929. An American journalist, producer, and author. Her name is Barbara Walters. Glenn Gould would have had a birthday today. It's also former military mad dog Robert Gates' birthday. You might remember Robert Gates as the head of the military during those evil Bush years, and then when Obama came in and he was going to stop everything, he he kept Robert Gates on, because the wars were never going to stop. I mentioned that many, many times. One of the biggest signs that I knew Obama wasn't going to be any different was that he kept Gates on. Keyboard player for Spirit and Nazareth, John Locke, born on this day, and the aforementioned Michael Douglas. It's also Cheryl Teague's birthday. Steve Mackey from the Stooges and Luke Skywalker. Mark Hamill born on this day. Bell Hooks, the late Christopher Reeve, Scotty Pippen, Will Smith. Isn't it Michael Douglas' wife or ex-wife? Catherine Zeta-Jones. They share a birthday. It's also Santi Gold's birthday. A basketball player whose name I just like, Chauncey Billups. He's having a birthday today. It's also the man behind the auto-tune T.I.'s birthday, Donald Glover, who you might know as Childish Gambino, and ex-placebo drummer Steve Forrest. All those folks celebrating birthdays today, we might hear from some of those more musical folks. You know I'm a big placebo fan, Santi Gold fan. But it is New Music Monday, so you can expect your Pump Up the Volume to contain pretty much all new music. Now, speaking of all new music... A 60s style garage psych band hailing from right here in peak Portland, Oregon. A huge thanks to our new music producer, Sean, for turning me on to all kinds of stuff so I can turn around and play it for you guys. Yes, I have some Led Zeppelin records. Do you really need me to play Led Zeppelin? Come on, Charm. (laughs) We're going to wrap up with new music from Portland's band, The Reverberations. This is their third release in 2017. They had a single out in early February. Then they dropped an EP in the summer. And now they've got a new song called Dreamcatcher from Portland's Reverberations as we wrap up your morning monarchy, my friends. Huge thanks to you. Please spread the word about us. We are independent, non-commercial, alternative media brought to you by you for over 12 years. And a thank you. That's it, your Geopolitics World News episode for Monday, September 25th, 2017. Indeed, I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Again, thanking you so much for listening and taking part and reminding you, as always, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care.
You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.